Hey, my God, you came. Aren't you fantastic? Come, please, you're such a surprise. Sit right here. <laughs> How are you? Who's this surprise? This, this, is, <laughs> this is the mayor of Cambridge. No, no, no. Hi, and how the, are you? The Jamaican mayor. Of Cambridge. A Jamaican, I hear. You, you summoned the Jamaican, so you know when you're doing that. This is fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. Hello, I'm Charlie Nesson. I am a professor here at Harvard Law School. We are actually at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard. And we are here with a wonderful group of people. Allow me to introduce them to you. Uh, first, immediately to my left, Diane Lucas, and to her left, Alex Lee, both students of mine in uh, a course, and they have both been students of mine in a clinical experience where they went to Jamaica and did a series of extraordinarily interesting interviews. Then, swinging way around to the far side, Mary Weld, another student of mine, uh, all three now in a class called Cyber One, Law in the Court of Public Opinion. And then in the center, our two guests. Uh, on the right, Ken Reeves, uh, mayor of the city of Cambridge and a Jamaican. And to his left, Monsignor Richard Albert, uh, a long-term resident and leader in uh, Jamaica and we're here actually to find out what the world looks like from the point of view of Monsignor Albert. And so with that I want to turn it over to my three students. Diane would you begin? Sure. Father Albert if you could tell us more about the role of religion in Jamaica particularly are most Jamaicans Christian or Catholic? Um, the the vast majority of the people would have a Christian affiliation. Um, there's a small Jewish community, ever increasing um, Muslim community, um, and the the Catholic Church. We're only three percent of the population. Um, the vast majority of the population are fundamentalists, uh, Church of God, Pentecostals. Seven Day Adventists. Rastafarians? Um, Rastafarians are um, certainly present and um, are, you know, uh, it's very interesting. They're not recognized by the parliament as an official um, religion. They continually do turn them down for official recognition. So they were recognized before? No, no. Um, certainly recognized by society as a. Um, uh, a group uh, of great influence, um, you know, and that influence really was spurned uh, to a greater height by Bob Marley. While the vast majority have a Christian affiliation and we're known as the country with more churches per square mile than anywhere else in the world, there's a disproportionate effect on the social life the moral life of the island itself. You would think that um, a country that had more churches per square mile might have a greater effect on, you know, the life of the people. There's just a, you know, a disconnect uh, by the churches, um, I think often to the social conditions of the lives of people. Jamaica has all been so been described as the most homophobic place oh, on earth. Yeah, and and I wonder why do you think that is, and do you agree? It's a major. I agree certainly that it is a, um, uh, outwardly a very homophobic country. And why it is, I I don't know. You try through education. You try through um, helping people to understand, but there's certainly on the roots level a grave homophobic attitude. Now when you get up and to the better educated people and as people get better educated that lessens. That lessens. I think the church you know um, tries to say over and over that you know everyone is a child of God and everyone you know is um, has to be accepted for who they are and that um, certainly um, you 
want to tell people that um, you have a responsibility to be, you know, respected and loved by everyone. Um, while on the other hand, um, the church is certainly the Catholic Church's teaching is that you know any sex outside of marriage, whether it's heterosexual or homosexual, is not what God intended. So God didn't intend Jamaica. <laughs> no. Well, in a sense, you would wonder. That's the reality we have to deal with. You have to take people where they're at. And you have to journey with people. And I don't care what their sexual orientation is. You have to be there for people. Can you just um, explain your mission in Jamaica, what it is you do, uh, what your goal is, and how you interact with people? I didn't go down with, you know, saying that this is my mission. Uh, I was overwhelmed by the poverty, I was overwhelmed by the crime, I was overwhelmed by, you know, so many situations that deprive people of their dignity and their wholeness. It was the old story of give them the fish for the day or teach them the fish. And the idea is to help people become self-reliant, to empower people, to give people the education, the skill that they can make the choices for themselves in life. And so I don't care how they vote, I don't care how they see their God, um, I don't care how they, um, you know, live their life, that's up to them. My challenge is, is to empower them so that they don't have to resort to drugs, to guns, to um, criminal activity. And unfortunately, for our 44 years of independence, um, our governments across the board haven't sufficiently offered those opportunities and we are overwhelmed by a debt of $72, uh, 72 cents of every dollar we earn goes back to pay the foreign debt. Um, we're overwhelmed by a, um, the, the massive poverty of um, the majority of Jamaicans that is now um, health, education, um, welfare is at a, you know, just a disastrous level for the poor. You talked about your program. How is it that you empower people? What are some of the things that you do? We teach them, first of all, they come into us and they have to go through socialization skills, um, personal hygiene. Why do you say good morning? Why do you say good afternoon? Why, if someone pushes you, you don't push them back? Because remember, the vast majority of the kids that come to us are coming from rough, tough, dysfunctional, neighborhoods and so we want to socialize them let them uh, try to help them understand that um, there are certain right ways of doing things so when I was talking to a group of them once I said why do you stand when I come in the classroom boy because you use the fodder because you use white because I said no you stand when I come in the classroom because it's the right thing to do because if you come into my office, I'm going to stand and greet you. And they don't understand that. We have this terrible thing in Jamaica of the big man and the little man. Mm -hmm. Hey, boss. You know. And when they call me and I say, hey, I'm a no one's boss. I have enough trouble you know, being my own boss, so don't mm -hmm. call me boss. Um, and we um, examine them academically. Can this kid read? Can this kid write? Can this kid express his self and ideas? And then we place them in a remedial program. And after a year, two years, maybe three years of that, then they move on to a skill. What would you like to do in life? Now they're 13, 14. What would you like to do with your life? You've learned now to be your own person. Um, and we get them into such a skill. Now, there are two tracks. Some go on to a skill, woodwork, sewing, tailoring, computering, welding, catering. And others, do so well academically, we get them back into the formal education because they're the people that are going to become the lawyers, the doctors, you see? So that it's very important to, once they come in, is to take the child where he's at and travel with them again. And when you see them starting to take off academically, well then, you know, just empower them and place them back now in a school where they are a student that's ready to deal with other human beings, ready to relate with other human beings. 
St. Patrick's Foundation, that's something that you've established. That's right. And you right. raise money through it. Right. Primarily from Jamaican or beyond the island? Beyond the island. Um, basically, I, I have a mailing list that I get help. I have to raise 350000 U.S. every year to support St. Patrick's Foundation. But my board of local businessmen and women, they match it with another 350000 Our budget's about 700000 a year. Mm -hmm. And that's for paying teachers, that's for oiling the machines, it's for, you know, getting new desks and getting equipment or whatever for the kids. Um, Is it boys and girls? Or boys and girls. Boys and girls in the whole system. Um, and we're located in an area called Kingston 11, Riverton Meadows, which is a very tough neighborhood, uh, Seaview Gardens, and Olympic Gardens. Are they boarding schools? No, no. We made a decision not to do that. Um, what we wanted to do, you see, if you take a kid from there um, in this live situation where they may not have electricity, where they may not be running water, when they're living in a wooden tin shack, and then put them in sort of an ideally, uh, idolized uh, type of situation where there's running water and <coughs> toilets and all of that, and then send them back out down there, you know, we felt what we wanted to do was prepare the, the young person to live in this situation and to work, empower them so that they could work out of that situation. Our class is called Law in the Court of Public Opinion. So I think we're looking at, we're interested in um, the roots of activism and the way that information spreads through a community and things like that. We're very interested, obviously, in new technologies like the internet. So one question I had is, are there, is there any kind of internet use, or if not, what sort of um, media are used? I mean, are, are newspapers important or something yes. like that nationally to spread information? And then a related question is, have you found that, uh, or have you heard stories of anyone who's gone through your programs then in turn sort of helping to spread some of these lessons to their, their own, you know, right. further communities? Um, in every one of my major centers, we have air-conditioned computer labs where all of the kids have to go through. And it's amazing, you know, when you see um, a five, six, seven-year-old child who lives in Riverton Meadows, which is a desperately poor community. And that little child, um, their whole world opens up to them. Their whole world. Do kids come back and help? Yes, absolutely. Many kids come back to become teachers. Many kids come back to um, become counselors um, and to help form the kids. Um, we have kids that have gone on to become policemen. We have kids that have gone in, in different professions and come back and give motivational talks. That's the challenge, is to bring people together and find that common bond in which we can say, you're my brother, you're <coughs> my sister, and I don't care how you vote. But in the Jamaica t of today, unfortunately, um, we see it as an excuse to fight and to kill and to break ourselves down. But some of that has got to be the real economics of the country. I mean, you know, in no country do you have a high marriage birth rate where, you know, the, the men can't take care of their families. Right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I think it's a, an extraordinarily high percentage, 92. but. That says something about the overall social fabric. And, Absolutely. And I'm going to suggest you this deep and inexplicable homophobia, which is often related to what the Bible says, although if you've got a 92% out of wedlock like birth rate, there's mm -hmm. some contradictions mm -hmm. in, in, in that mm -hmm. equation. Mm -hmm. But the point is, Jamaica's society seems to be in utter turmoil, in part due to the return of everybody deported from the U.S., Canada, and mm -hmm. England, mm -hmm. particularly uh, infusing a, a very advanced criminal element in the major cities. You have a, 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 a real awful context, which is distinct from Barbados or Trinidad, mm -hmm. which is, is, for me, sort of a riddle, because right next door, Things may be as poor, but they're not as desperate in these uh, multiplicity of uh, interconnected ways. So. Ken, what's your answer to your own question? What do you do? You theorize about the roots of homophobia in Jamaica. Well, let me say I'm a gay Jamaican, and I was the first openly gay 
African American mayor in this country. So I, this kind of comes to me as an issue because when I, there have been instances in Jamaica where gay people have been like grabbed out of their house on the front porch while the, the police watch, the neighborhood just hacks them up to death. Which, you know, I, I love all things Jamaican, but this barbarism is not, I'm not with that. The, the religious connection I know more about Jamaican is the Anglican one, mm -hmm. because uh, the middle and upper middle class seem to have favored that from British times. And they, there's quite a class structure there. And the peculiar thing, he talked about how the doctors and the lawyers and the teachers leave. Well, at one period in Jamaica's history, in fear of everybody leaving, they were retiring light-skinned civil servants at like 45 years old, lifetime pension. So it, it was, and, and so some of the, the class resentment is from that kind of thing. I've never met a dumb Jamaican. <laughs> and, it's a, and, and they're very creative and passionate people. Um, but there is something very difficult going on now, particularly in cities. Mm -hmm. And so... So uh, it sounds like you haven't got a theory. No, I'm not, not a good working hypothesis. Because the other problem is that I frankly wouldn't go to Kingston for fear of just, you know, I wouldn't know how to look poor enough to be sure that somebody wouldn't mug me. Um, several things. First of all, Barbados and Trinidad are at a much better economic level than we are, mm. okay? Um, because of poor leadership, um, we've been put in this position over the years. I think with the right leadership, we could have done much better. We've had horrendous financial economic scandals that have just destroyed the public person. Kingston, as our capital, um, faces many challenges, but um, ever increasingly it's uh, a, a nice city to visit. There's some good things happening there. Um, I think that the greatest challenge for us as a Jamaican family, and I became a Jamaican several years ago, a uh, mm. citizen, so I can talk of it as our family. I think our, our greatest challenge is to um, break down the barriers that keep us divided, and that's not going to happen until we um, bring the both society, the two Jamaicas, as Mr. Siaga called it, uh, uptown and downtown, until we bring them together educationally, economically, socially. When that happens, then I think you're going to see a whole different world and you're going to see life like in Barbados, where they don't have the violence. No society is ideal, but you certainly want to get to a point where you can say, you know, you don't have the worst figures for murder in the world, you know. Can you talk a little bit about the crime in Jamaica, um, particularly about dons and things like that? I think for people in America that's something that's very surprising and mm -hmm. a little confusing. In the, in the 1970s, um, the political parties armed themselves. And I went to Jamaica in 1976. And in 1979-80, we had over almost or a little over a thousand people murdered on the streets during a political campaign, and um, and we're a population of 2.6 million or so, and that was mostly Kingston. And these people were armed by the political director. It says at least that is the common theory that's held. They're independent warlords. They they're well armed. They finessed and are supported by the drug trade. They control whole sections of the city of Kingston and Spanish Town. While they're the Don and they get the extortion money and they get the drug money, you know, they also have to give back. So that if there's a funeral, they got to pay for it. If there's kids that need money for school, they got to give it. Um, so that it's a, you know, very you know, intertwined relationship with the community that they they run. Because I work in the inner city, um, I've become over the years very close to many of these guys. Um, I never work with anyone who's wanted by the police except to turn themselves in. If 
they want to turn themselves in, I'll help get them in alive, which I have in the past. I'm now head of the Crime Prevention Committee in Spanish Town, which has become a very violent area. So I deal with all the Dons. I meet with anyone. I meet with politicians. I meet with private sector people. Um, I meet with all um, community leaders that they're called now. Just less than a year ago, I took people from PMP area, um, JLP area, and a mixed area in the, called Jones Avenue, Shelter Rock, Dempshire Penn, and they said, listen, we're tired. Eighteen of our men have been killed this past year and a half. We want to stop because they were fighting with each other. So I said, okay, and I met with the area leaders and we talked for weeks. And then we decided there was zinc fences, bar, um, um, keeping the communities apart. And we had a march and we just went and knocked down through all three communities and knocked down those dividing walls and hundreds and hundreds of people gathered and cheered and clapped. This is from PMP and JLP side, you know. They were so happy to see that this was broken down. You have life on the wild side. <laughs> now, now, this is somewhat of a wild side uh, production because I'm going to have to pirouette and eject myself okay. from the conversation. But I wanted you to have this. And I Thank you, Mayor. Also, God bless you. You know, you Thank are you. doing God's work with God's people. So no, I want I'm you trying. to, you asked about the Cambridge connection. We're going to have men. Great. But to assure that, I want to seal that with this. Oh. I give you the key to our city. Hey, thank and, you and, very and, much. And, and, and its owners will be to see you soon. <laughs> thank you. Thank you oh. very much. God bless you. Thank you very much. Take care. We'll be in touch. Yes. Well, thank you. Yes. Thank you. So I, I wanted to uh, ask you about Marcus Garvey. Yes. Uh, Portia Simpson Miller has identified as an objective, somehow rethinking, retelling, reformulating, representing the story of Marcus Garvey, uh, the number one national hero of Jamaica, whom many people have forgotten. That's right. And even more people who know something about him don't really have a sense of what an extraordinary sure. creative character he was. He, a, a flawed person who was not able to pull all of his dreams off That's completely, right. yet someone who truly had dreams and... Who instilled black pride in the black, not only American, but black Caribbean person before the word was ever common, mm -hmm. who made people think and reflect on who they were as individuals way before a Martin Luther King did. But Marcus Garvey was certainly a prophet in every way that word describes. I think uh, certainly a man who stands very tall in letting um, not only black people but all people regain a sense of dignity as who they are as a person. He certainly was dedicated to his race, his mighty race as he called them. Um, there is an attempt also to um, get his name taken off the book of uh, crime here in the States, mm -hmm. the, that he should be cleared. Um, it looked like it was a trumped up um, uh, charge mm -hmm. that uh, mail fraud. And, but they, they were working in any way they could to get him out of the United States. And, and why? Only because I think they, you know, the forces of racism in this country, the forces of, um, you know, destruction in this country, wanted him out because he was changing lives. He was changing the way people thought of themselves. History is going to show probably that it was trumped up charges because this man was empowering people. Jamaican is the only Caribbean <clears throat> nation to have had the success that it has in exporting parts of its own culture to the rest of the world. Not just because of Bob Marley, but because of mm -hmm. I mean, a, a number of different um, Whether it's cultural sports, icons that loom very, music, very large. Right. I'm, I'm not quite sure how to articulate it, but what, I mean, how that could be harnessed to lead the country forward. The fact that there is a very strong cultural identity um, and... Well, it has certainly identity. helped us, Mary, with our tourism. I mean, it's been a, a marketing tool 
yeah. you know, Bob Marley in so many ways. We haven't translated um, the um, marketing skills of using Bob Marley and reggae in that way. That hasn't seeped down to the hundreds of thousands of Jamaicans living in abject poverty. Is there any sort of campaign for debt forgiveness? Is that something that the government is focusing on? You see, on um, uh, countries forgave us our debts. Certain countries forgave us our debts. And that was wonderful, especially in the year 2000. But the problem is now they're borrowing from banks. Because that's the only way they can okay. get money. The banks don't forgive debts. Right. I have a question about race and color in Jamaica. As we know, Marcus Garvey was all about black pride. And Black power, but you mentioned earlier the um, division in color, yes. lines in class. Do you think that renewing his legacy would have an effect on that at all? I would hope that it would um, help the brown person um, be proud that they have some black in them. Some of the poorest people that I lived and worked with, um, their um, you know brown mother told her, "You make sure you marry up," mm -hmm. and she wasn't talking economics. Again, only education is going to get rid of that. The only education is going to, you know, get people to understand that, you know, um, whether you're light, whether you're dark, whether you're in between, what's important is what's inside you. What's important is who you are as a person. Um, what's important is, uh, you know, not what you have, but what you give away. We were just in Jamaica, <coughs> Alex and Diane, Mary wasn't there, but uh, we were participating in Emancipation and Independence Day, mm -hmm. uh, actually making a program for the public broadcasting company of Jamaica. And the thesis that emerged in our program <clears throat> was that Jamaica originates as a slave colony of the mm -hmm. British, and the institutions that the British put in place were put there for the purpose of maintaining control mm -hmm. over the people. Mm -hmm. and those institutions consisted of the structures of slavery, but since slavery, the structures of education, right. the structures of religion, mm -hmm. the structures of government, all the structures. And in fact, when Jamaica became independent in 1962, they changed practically nothing. They adopt a constitution that was okay with the British, but it really wasn't an act of independence on their part. It was an act of negotiation to get right. separated from them. Right. Now, 44 years into their legal independence, it seems like it's the right time for Jamaica to think of reconstituting itself and in some independent way re-expressing and reformulating these base institutions. Well, both political parties have said that they want to become Republican. I think the winds of change are coming, and they, they certainly want to, um, and, and I believe that it's constitutional change that's going to better empower the Jamaican person. But you have to remember it's the, these dying colonial segments that still exist as, um, you know, sugarcane. You know, we, we still have sugar, sugar cane plantations where people are living in substandard housing and are out there cutting sugar cane as if they were living a hundred years ago. Poverty, hunger, unemployment make a mockery of what independence should be for our people. Too many of our people are still enslaved and the private sector has to, and the NGO sector, sector and the church have to be ways and means in which we can help free the people from these things. There's about 400,000 of them on the streets of every little village and town in Kingston unemployed, doing nothing, just sitting all day doing nothing. Can't the finest minds at the university, can't the finest minds of the PSOJ, private sector organization in Jamaica, come together and say, if we do A, B, C, and D, we can employ these people. Maybe we'll have to um, get them trained. Maybe we'll have to... No one's doing anything for these people. 
No one's doing anything for them. And until they decide that even if it's out of selfishness for our own self-preservation, we better get down there and help those people. And I'm not saying everyone. Uh, St. Patrick's Foundation exists because I have a wonderful group of um, businessmen and women who really are giving their life and making their contribution, their social contribution, through St. Patrick's Foundation for the betterment of Jamaica. But it's nowhere near sufficient as far as the numbers of people. Monsignor Albert, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Mary, thank you. you. Alex, thank you. Yeah. Diane, thank you. And uh, if I may say thank you to you for joining us as well.